Good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and get started so we can kind of keep us on our schedule for today. My name is Ann White. I am the Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Professions here at the University of Southern Indiana, and we're so glad that you're here on campus as we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. Um, we started this conference 12 years ago, and we were ecstatic when we had 100 people come and join us for this conference. So it is, I'm really pleased to announce that we have 440 participants for this conference today, which is an absolute record. And so we appreciate every single one of you being here today and being interested enough in nursing leadership to be participating in this whole process. So I have some things that I need to share with you, and then we'll move right into the presentation this morning. We also have quite a few students. I see the University of Evansville is here in purple, and we have some red in uh, USI students. And we're also glad that they're able to participate with us as we look at the future of nursing and the future of nursing leadership. So the one thing that we're going to probably be challenged with today is finding enough places for everyone to sit. So it, this is kind of like a church. You know, you need to come to the front of the, the um, uh, room here because there are seats. So we've got to kind of work at this to make sure we've got everybody having a place to sit. Okay, so if you can assist us with that, that would be greatly appreciated. We want to also recognize our sponsors, and you will see some of this as I'm talking through it. It's also on the overhead projector. Uh, but we have IONE, the Southwest Region, as a sponsor, University of Southern Indiana, University of Evansville, Deaconess Hospital System, and St. Mary's Medical Center. We also have a silver exhibitor, which is Memorial Hospital and Healthcare Center in Jasper, Indiana. And we have a friend exhibitor, which is Health South, uh, Deaconess Rehabilitation Hospital. I uh, would like to also um, identify and, I guess, ask you to give people a round of applause, and that's the members of the planning committee. They have worked really hard all year to put this particular conference and, and subsequent conferences together. So it, are members of the planning committee here in the room, because I know some of them are still outside helping with people uh, getting set up. So if you're a member of the planning committee, would you please stand? Okay, we've got a couple of them in the back, Peggy Grawl and Dr. Sheila Houck. Do we have anybody else here that's part of the planning committee? Because they, ah, they're Linda Kaysen, soon to be Dr. Linda Kaysen. Anybody else? Would you please help me say thank you to those individuals? You will also, for those of you who have been here before, remember that we have an oasis. We always have an oasis when we have a leadership conference, and there is always some opportunities for shopping, 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 and some other good things to also enjoy ourselves along the day as well. So they will be along the hallway as we are looking at UC East and West. Okay, we're on the east side right, or no, are we on the east or west? West, okay. We're west, and so you'll see it all along the east and west on this second floor. You'll see various booths where our exhibitors are there, but you'll also see various booths that have this piece with the oasis. Each of you have also had your name entered for attendance prizes, and we will be drawing names at the end of the conference. Um, these, you'll see some of them, and they're starting to collect at the front of the, the room here. One name will also be drawn during the closing session for a complimentary registration to next year's conference. But a word to the wise, you have to be present to win. So just so you know, you've got to be here. There are um, three separate areas for breaks, and we're getting more coffee. For those of you that need coffee in the morning, we are getting more coffee, so we'll have plenty of coffee for everyone. Uh, so there are two stations along the hallway here, and there's another one on the other side. So hopefully with this many people, we'll try to be as responsive as we can to your needs along the way. Um, we have made arrangements for the students, and this is information for the students. You should have all received a meal ticket. 
that you got when you checked in this morning, and that will allow you to go to the various locations that we have here on campus for your lunch. And all you need to do is present that meal ticket to any place that you're going, and then they'll take it from there, okay? So on the second floor, there's the loft. On the first floor, there's Burger King and Sub Connection. On UC East, there's Archie's Pizzeria, Salsa Rico, and Cyclone Salads. So you can go to any of those locations and present your, your ticket. Um, you should have all received an email indicating that there was some information that you were going to be receiving through email or through an app. Um, this is important information. There is a link that will connect you to all of the information for the conference through this website. Uh, it also has the site that will be available to you for two weeks to complete the evaluation. And for those of you that are very interested in continuing education hours, you need to make sure that you complete that evaluation and complete all the information that's requested and then your um, attendance certificate that documents your continuing education hours will be sent to you. So make sure that you have access to that particular link. And if you don't, please then see people at the registration desk because that will be critically important for you as you're moving along the day here. You did see that we have Wi-Fi and that system is available. You should have seen, again, as we're going through um, the, the scrolling here, that the username and the password are the same thing. And it's USI NLC, Nursing Leadership Conference 2015, and that should get you access to Wi-Fi. If those of you that are interested in uh, using that, uh, please do so. Again, if you have challenges with that, please talk to the registration desk. Also wanted to indicate that uh, we need to have you mark your calendar for the 13th Annual Nursing Leadership Conference on April 6th, 2016, and that will be held at the University of Evansville. So one last uh, important message that when there's 400 and some people, there are restrooms all over the place in this building, both on the east side and the west side. So, um, you know, you'll, you'll find when there is a need for bodily functions, you have places to go, okay? So Peggy, did I cover everything? Okay, so with that, I have the pleasure of introducing our morning speaker. And this is Regina Holliday. She is a Washington, D.C. Pay based patient advocate and an artist known for painting a series of murals depicting the need for clarity and transparency in medical records. This advocacy mission was inspired by her husband, Frederick Allen Holliday II, and his struggle to get appropriate care during 11 weeks of continuous hospitalization in five facilities. After his death, from kidney cancer on June 17, 2009, she began 73 cents, a mural depicting her husband's dying in darkness surrounded by inaccessible technological tools in a closed data loop. The title refers to the cost per page for medical records in the state of Maryland. Holiday's artwork became part of the national health care debate and was reported on in the mainstream press as well as reviewed by such journals as BMJ and APA. She began an advocacy movement called the Walking Gallery for which medical providers and advocates wear patient story paintings on the backs of business suits. She authored The Walking Wall, 73 Cents to the Walking Gallery. Recently, Holiday was honored at the HITS Men and Women's Award reception for her trailblazing vision and perseverance in advancing the adoption of health, IT, innovation, and best practices to improve health care. Backed by her own patient and caregiving experience, Regina Holiday travels the globe heralding her message of patient empowerment and inclusion in health care decision making. She fearlessly stands before officials and practitioners demanding a thoughtful dialogue on the role patients play in their own health care. Please help me welcome Regina Holliday. I am exceedingly glad to be here today. I have been blessed by being in Indiana multiple times, and this is my second time here. And I am so excited to see this room almost filled to bursting. That is amazing. 
and shows what vision and leadership that all of you bring to nursing and multiple fields. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. I bet they're trying to get that up right now. I don't know if Peggy's working on that, but I can talk to you really briefly about what it is that I'm doing. Um, over here, I'm painting a painting about healthcare while I listen to what all of you speak. So I was listening to your conference attendees and planners and individuals in the hallway and sort of painting about the feelings that I've been hearing from the individuals here today. Let's see if they've got, they're almost there. Technical difficulties happen a lot within healthcare. You're probably used to that. We have a technical person coming right on up. Very exciting. Um, so I live in Western Maryland now. I don't know if you heard in the bio that I lived in Washington, D.C. I lived in Washington, D.C. for 16 years. So I love D.C. and I fly out of D.C. But now I live in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains up in Western Maryland. So who here is from rural health? Rural health. Yes. Yay. You're doing amazing work. I'm so glad that I now live in a community of 825 people. Okay. Uh, because when I go to federal meetings and we start talking about rural health, I find a lot of those people in the room have absolutely no idea what's going on in rural health. And I'm also excited to say the town that I live in recently got, I'm sorry, sure, that one. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, the town that I live in recently got a, uh, a medical clinic. We got a medical home clinic in our tiny little town, and that was due to federal dollars invested in rural health. So it's so exciting to see. So what I want to talk to you about whoops, today is, okay, let's see if it's going to let me do this. Okay, so when I was a young person, I really struggled to read. I struggled to understand what people were talking about. I struggled <laughs> to sit still, okay? So in venues like this, I'm so amazed to see all of you sitting still because that's something I cannot do. That's why I often have those easels over to the side. And that's why I have a standing desk at home. But when I was a little child, I had to sit still in church, okay? And so my mom said to me, Regina, if you can't sit still, what you should do is you should draw. You should draw the sermons. You should draw what the pastor says. And I drew hundreds and hundreds of sermons. And then um, years later, I had a little boy, my son Freddie. And he is just like me. He cannot sit still. He has trouble concentrating. And I told my little son Freddie, I said, when you're in church, just draw the sermon. And it'll let you stay still. And he began doing it. And in one Sunday, my son was drawing this amazingly unusual picture. He had drawn all these tiny little houses at the bottom. He had drawn people in the middle. And then he had drawn this big half circle at the top of the picture. And I said, Freddie, what is it that you're drawing? And he said, Mom, I'm drawing Noah's Ark from below. <laughs> uh, whoa. <laughs> i, I got to tell you, I've seen Noah's Ark lots of times. It's like, like this rainbow, and there's a, the birds and triumphant animals and triumphant people. And there's an ark, and it's beautiful. And that is an amazing story, and that is what we call an A story. But there's often a B, right? There's often a different perspective, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So I struggled. I actually flunked first grade, which is challenging to do, but I pulled it off. Um, I, I couldn't quite understand the whole concept of reading. A teacher said A is for apple. I said, got it. A equals apple. They're like, no, no, it's a sound. I said, okay, I can't figure this out. So I started drawing apples. I thought, I can just draw everything. Well, that will guarantee failure. Um, in my second year of first grade, I was drawing in class, and my teacher would often send me to the principal's office for drawing in class. And you know what happens when you get there? The principal's not there. So what the secretary does is she gives you crayons and paper and you get a draw. <laughs> so I drew there too. And then this is my recess playground when I was a child. This is the wall beside my elementary school from childhood. And I would draw on that wall. At that point, it was all painted white. And I would take Oklahoma sandstone and I would just scrawl across that wall all kinds of drawings. And that helped me get through a hard time in my life. 
Now, the other thing that happened was when I was a child, there was amazing television. And I was watching in Oklahoma the same program as my future husband was watching in Maryland. Okay? And through the 70s and 80s, I learned how to be a patient through those programs. So if you look at these characters here, that's Grandma Walton. Okay? So I loved Grandma Walton. I was only a little girl. I didn't have a grandma. She was just the best. And then all of a sudden she disappeared. She wasn't on the show. And I didn't know why she went away. But about a year later, the actress came back, and it turned out she had had a stroke. So she couldn't use her face very well anymore, and she couldn't use her voice very well. And years before the ADA Act passed, the producers of that show brought her back and had her perform on national television as a disabled person. And it was amazing. And she was loving and kind, and I believed in her. And it was personally important to me because my mother got Bell's palsy later that year. So I watched her face fall. I watched her get an eye patch. But I knew because of Grandma Walton, she was going to get better. Then there was Quincy, Quincy Emmy. I love that show too. I watched Forensic Science as a small child. It was wonderful. And, and what I didn't realize while I was watching these programs, he was actually affecting real history. See, the actor Jack Klugman, who played Quincy on television, he testified before Congress to try to pass something called the Orphan Drug Act. And he was just a man playing a doctor on television but he helped pass that important piece of legislation that still affected your patients today. Then there's Hawkeye Pierce. Now, MASH was my husband's favorite show. It was such his favorite show that when I met him in his 20s, he still had camouflage bedding and curtains in his room. Okay? <laughs> That's how to be a fan. But, but back in 1983, when the last episode came on the air, it was the largest audience, viewing audience in the nation up until the 2010 Super Bowl. That's how many people watched the last episode of MASH. And if you watch that night, you know what happened. You know that there was Hawkeye Pierce, and he was on a bus, and there was a woman, and she had a chicken, and the chicken just wouldn't shut up. So he told her she had to make the chicken be quiet because the enemy were all around. And she did it. And we watched a doctor we loved have a complete nervous breakdown. Because as the episode progressed, she realized it wasn't a chicken. It was her baby that she suffocated in her own lap to make it be quiet. And we watched a doctor deal with that. We watched someone who caused harm in the medical profession deal with that. And we went on that journey with him. Then there was The Incredible Hulk. I don't know if you watched that, but I did. I loved it. It was a wonderful family programming. But if you go back and watch the pilot again, what's amazing about that show is the first 30 minutes of the first episode was completely dedicated to watching a spouse who loved his wife so very much do everything he could to save her. And when he could not, decided to dedicate the rest of his life to changing things. But medically, the one that was most important to me was Mary Ingalls, okay? So Mary Ingalls was on this show called Little House on the Prairie, right? And there was an episode where she was pulling her eyes, she was squinting at the chalkboard, and I was doing everything Mary was doing. And I said, Mom, Mom, I'm just like Mary, I need glasses. She said, oh no, you're only in fourth grade, you don't need glasses? And I said, I do, I do need glasses. Now, we were an uninsured family, which meant we rarely ever went to the doctor. So, so if you were sick, that's what Vicks Vapor Rub is for, okay? <laughs> if you're a little more sick, mom had this stuff from the 1930s called Green Drops, and it cures everything. You put sugar in it, and you eat it, and you pour it in your ears, you use it as an ointment. Well, she still had her bottle from the 30s, and she would give it to us occasionally. <laughs> but if that didn't work, there was the doctor. And when I would see the doctor, he'd look in my eyes, he'd look in my nose, he'd look in my ears, he'd look in my mouth, but then he'd walk away from me. He'd walk my arm and say, Mrs. McCandless, your daughter has another tonsil infection. Here's your prescription. You need to fill this, and then you need to make sure she comes back if she doesn't get better. And then he'd walk out of the room. That was my experience with doctors. Well, the eye doctor was completely different. Okay? When you go to the eye doctor, they put you in this room, they turn off the light, and they ask you to sit on a throne. Okay? And then they start sliding all these glass slides in front of your eyes, and they go click, 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 and then the doctor says, this one better, or this, A, or B, one, or two, and you're listening to the doctor, and you're responding every time, and, and I, as I was listening, and I was talking to him, I was realizing, he's doing everything I say, I'm in charge of a grown man, and I'm in fourth grade, and I was so excited, and finally, click, 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 everything got clear, I could see, and then one week later, my glasses came, and I could see there are leaves on trees again. And it was amazing. 
Now, the challenging thing that happened to me in fourth grade is it was great that I got glasses. The other thing that was great was I had an amazing teacher. Her name was Mrs. Graham. She realized I had dyslexia and dysgraphia. I wasn't stupid. I just didn't understand what she was talking about. And she put me on something called an individual education plan before we commonly did that. And she gave me words like cat and rat and sat to spell in fourth grade when all the other kids were spelling encyclopedia. And, and, when, and when I would do well, she would write this most beautiful red A on my work. And I felt so proud. And when I was going to do my report card with her, she was asking me about how to spell my name because my canvas was a little bit odd. It's got the two C's. And I said, oh, it's big C, then it's little c. She says, I think it's the other way. And I said, no, no, it's supposed to be an M and a big C and a little c. And she said, okay. And she wrote it that way because she loved me and she trusted me. Well, we weren't only a poor family and an uninsured family. My father was an alcoholic and he was abusive. So when I brought that report card home to him for him to sign, he began to write really bad words to my teacher. Because she was stupid, obviously, since she didn't know how to spell my name. So I couldn't let him do that because she'd been kind and she was loving. So I told my dad, no, no, it's my fault. I told him to write that. I told her to write that on my card. And he looked at me. And there had been this pink, hard plastic brush beside the desk because I'd been brushing my hair before. And he picked up the brush and just smacked me on the side of the head with it for being so stupid as to not even know how to write my name correctly. And I had a big welt on my face. And I had to go to school like that. And I went there and I couldn't go in the classroom. I couldn't let them see me like this. So I just sat on the stairs and I waited. I waited for my teacher to come out. And then I told her everything. Everything that he had done to me. And she told me to go to the bathroom and to wash off my face and come back to class. And nothing happened. Now, at my school, we would have visitors occasionally. We had the firefighter. He taught you stop, drop, and roll. We had the dentist. He gave you those pink pills. They turned your teeth all red. Well, three weeks after I talked to my teacher, a policeman came to my class. He said to the whole class, there may be a time in your life where you see abuse. It's either in your home or a friend's home. When that abuse becomes too bad, we... These are numbers that you can call. And I looked at that card and I looked at those numbers and I thought, oh no. Obviously, the abuse isn't bad enough yet. Obviously, I have to wait till it becomes too bad and then I can call these numbers. So I waited seven years to the point that my father threatened to kill the whole family. And that's the night I called those numbers. You may be in rooms where some people say things like, semantics are not important. I tell you they are. The words we use are powerful things. And what patients hear you say may be very, very different than what you think you told them. I managed to go to high school. I managed to graduate. I went to college. I met an amazing man in college. His name was Frederick Allen Holiday II. We took a scenic painting course together. We painted with long bamboo sticks like these children are doing. And we would actually really horribly procrastinate. I don't recommend that you ever do this, right? Uh, so, so we'd start our work at 10 o'clock at night, and it was due 8 o'clock in the morning. So, so we would be in class, and we'd be painting, and we would talk about Stephen King, because we were both huge Stephen King fans. But he was a Catholic, and I was a Lutheran, and, and I was a Democrat, and he was whatever party disagreed with that. And, <laughs> and, and we would just get these huge fights, and by 3 o'clock in the morning, we'd be throwing paintbrushes at each other. And I've got to tell you, if you really want to learn about a person, pull routine all-nighters with them, right? Because you have complete filter failure at 3 a.m., okay? So after an entire semester like this, we realized we were in love, and we decided to get married. So my husband, whoops, this clicker. Um, my husband, he basically decided to get a master's degree in film studies. He got a Ph.D. in film studies. He wrote his dissertation on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, okay? There are not a lot of jobs in that field, just to warn you. Um, the uh, children were born. We had Freddie in 1998. And we had Isaac in 2006, and our life was rolling along. We were very, very busy. During this time, what I was doing is I was working retail sales at a toy store and a bookstore, and I was doing neighborhood murals part-time. This, this is our family picture in 2007. 
This is done by Ola Mills Photography, who came to our church. Thank you, Ola Mills. And um, this was at 9 o'clock at night at Christmas time. Okay? <laughs> Don't we look amazing? <laughs> yeah, so, so I was very happy. This is, this, was, this is our only family picture, and I cherish it to this day. In 2007, my husband and I were working six jobs between the two of us. He had adjunct positions at two universities and was working as a video store clerk. I was working at the toy store and was a preschool art teacher at two different schools. But though we were each of us, between the two of us, working six jobs, we couldn't afford health insurance for the whole family and pay our rent in D.C. So we basically would just pay out of pocket whenever it was needed. Oops. So, okay. In January of 2008, we had this time in our lives when we realized we have to change this. It's too hard on our family. So we made New Year's resolutions. And they're the, I don't think I'm going to go to this because the clicker doesn't seem to work. Um, they were the kind of New Year's resolutions that were really realistic, okay? We wanted to get family health insurance. We wanted Fred to get a job in his field. Our oldest son had just been diagnosed with autism, and we wanted him to be able to get the kind of education that he deserved, and that would be in a non-public school. We wanted to spend more time together as a family because this six-job thing was killing us, basically. And we wanted to get a two-bedroom apartment because we were a family of four living in a one-bedroom apartment. And the beautiful thing that happened is almost all of our wishes and prayers came true. Fred was hired at American University, which gave him the job, they gave him the insurance, which gave us more time to spend together as a family. Our son got into Ivy Mount School, which was a special ed school, and everything was looking up. We thought, hey, we didn't get the two-bedroom apartment yet, but I bet it's coming. In, two, in the fall of 2008, Fred loved his job. He was working really hard at it. He had this business card that was not made on our home printer, okay? And he handed it out to everybody. And um, the only bad thing was he was tired and fatigued all the time. And he went to the doctor, and the doctor said he had hypertension. Now, I thought this was odd because Fred had actually been losing weight. He was thinner than he'd been in years, and when he lost so much weight, he started to purposely lose weight, and he was exercising. So I thought, why are we getting hypertension now? If you read my husband's status lines from January and February and March of 2009 on Facebook, you would almost see a pattern. He was hurting and sick most of the time. So in January, he was, ribs were hurting so much that he went to an ER. So he had had a bad cough. We'd all had a bad cough that January. And when he went to the ER, they said he'd broken his ribs, probably from the coughing. Now, he's only 38 years old at the time, so we thought this was a bit unusual, but occasionally it happens. So he was given pain medication for the coughing. Then in February, he started having excruciating lower back pain and was given more pain medication. Now he's on two types of narcotic pain medication. He has a new problem. He can't go to the bathroom because nobody prescribed laxatives. So now we have to go back to the doctor to go to that. By March, my husband was on two types of muscle relaxants, four types of painkillers, and four types of laxatives. And we had no idea what was causing him so much pain. On March 13th of 2009, Fred was hurting so much that he came home from work on a Friday night and he was crying. And he couldn't really sit anymore. He had to stand or he had to lay down. It just hurt too much to sit. So I said, let's go to the pretty ER and let's find out what's wrong with you. So we bagged up some toys for the children and we went to the most lovely ER. It has stained glass windows and there's a coffee shop and there's a gift shop. There's these beautiful blue couches everywhere. And we sat and we waited. We waited for three hours for someone to come out from Express Wound Care saying they were backed up. There would be no tests, no MRI, no CAT scan. They wouldn't be able to see him. He might as well just go home and see his doctor next week, but here's some more pain medication. The next week I went with my husband to the doctor. Now, he's a grown man, so I didn't usually do this, but I thought, I've got to find out what's wrong with you because we're, we're getting nowhere. And when I got to the doctor, they just waved him into the examination room. I said, aren't you going to weigh him? They said, oh, we don't always weigh our patients. Like, really? <laughs> My doctor always weighs me. I know we have conversations afterwards. <laughs> but she said, well, he's been in here frequently. We don't always weigh those patients. I said, I'm concerned because, you know, he's losing weight. And losing weight can be a sign of disease. But she went, said, go on into the room. And I, I was there with my husband when the doctor walked in. Now, she walked in with a flip chart. And she said, so, Mr. Holiday, do you think maybe you're depressed? Now, we couldn't believe it. We said, of course, of course, Fred's depressed. He hurts all the time at this point. 
Um, we want something called an open MRI. I looked it up online. My husband's claustrophobic, and they make these open kind that's not so scary. And we need that because we've got to find out what's wrong with him. I think there might be something wrong with his kidneys. She says, oh, no, it's probably a protuberance of lumbar 5. Some people suffer from that condition. Some people, it's not a problem at all. I said, well, we've been seeing you for about three months now, and you don't know what's wrong with him. So I'm demanding an MRI. And we managed to find a little medical clinic in Olney, Maryland, which is way out in the country. And they were willing to see my husband that week. So he drove all the way out there. He got a CD. He drove it all the way back in town. He gave it to that doctor. And then four days later, she called us. She called us to say that she looked at the CD and she would like us to make an appointment with an oncologist she knew. Here was the phone number. Click. And, you know, I knew so little about medicine then, I didn't know what an oncologist was. I had to look up that it's a cancer doctor. And I made the appointment for the very next day. So on March 25th, we went into the hospital for tests. And, and we got there, the doctor could see he was in a lot of pain and he couldn't sit very well. And he said, why don't we admit you for tests just to see what's going on? And so we got him up to his room and I got him into his bed and then I left him there. I didn't know you don't leave patients by themselves in hospitals. I had two little kids at home, and I was supposed to work at the toy store, and I didn't know that. So on March 27, which was a Friday, my husband was at the hospital when I was working a shift at the toy store. And I was selling this lovely couple of toy in the art section when my boss came up to me and said, Regina, it's your husband. And I picked up that phone, and he was crying. He was so scared. He said, Reggie, the doctor was in my room. He says, I have tumors and growths in my abdomen. I have a three centimeter tumor in my kidney. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Can you please get here and help me? And I, I, I said, I'm leaving. I'm going to go. I'll be there as soon as I can. And I didn't drive. So I asked my boss's wife if she could drive me to the hospital. And so she did. And she said, you listen, listen, when you're there, you've got to write everything down because you're going to be the person who makes sure he gets good care. So I went there, and I ran to my husband, and I hugged him, and I said, I love you, and, and I'm going to find the doctor. I'm going to find out what's going on. And so I went to the nurse's station. I said, where is the doctor? Where is the doctor who just was in my husband's room? And she said, oh, well, he's left for a medical conference. He's going to be gone for the next four days. So we waited in his room, and then we tried calling. We tried emailing. He didn't respond. And me and my in-laws and my husband were waiting in the room. There were more tests. There was a bone scan. There was a PET scan. And nobody would talk to us. There were computers all down the hallway. And everybody said they couldn't tell us what they said. And then finally on the fourth day, an on-call doctor comes in the room. And she walks right up to the PCA pump and starts checking the bolus amount. And we say, what about the tests? He had more tests. He had what's called a PET scan and a bone scan. What's the, did, did, has it spread? She just looked at us. She said, you mean no one's talked to you? Like, no, no one talks to us. She said, well, it's spread. It's everywhere. It's in his bones and lungs. So that night, I went to my home computer and I typed my husband myself. He had stage four kidney cancer. When the doctor got back into town after his medical conference the following week, he went to my husband at 7.30 rounds and said to him, so, I understand your wife's asking questions about this case. And my husband was frightened because he used to work in food service and he knows exactly what happens to your hamburger if you send it back. <laughs> so he did not want to make waves. And he said, I'm sorry, yes, she's been asking questions. He said, well, if little Miss A-type personality has questions, she should come to my office hours to ask them. And I did. And this is a painting of that day. And everything is real to the moment, except for they did give me a chair beside the trash can but I was emotionally kneeling. They never closed the door. This one nurse, she wants to know about the, why the one employee keeps parking in the wrong parking spot. It's just driving her crazy. And this other nurse, she wants to know about Miss Rosen's chemotherapy suite and whether it will be available later today because they need to book it. And he keeps answering the phone call the entire time he's talking with me. But then he, when he does talk to me, he speaks so rapidly in words I don't understand. And I'm trying to write them down as fast as I can. And I say, please, please, could you slow down a little bit? Because I don't know these words. I have to research them online. And he said, I don't like people who research online. I said, I'm sorry. 
but I don't have a background in medicine. My only way to understand you is to research these terms. He said, that's right. I'm the one with a medical degree. So if you look in this painting on the back wall, what looks like a diploma on the wall there that says, I have the medical degree. And if you look over to the side, there's a portrait of his family, but I don't think it was done by Olin Mills Photography. And if you look in the shadows behind that painting, it's my family. My family. Because this moment may be only one moment in the busy workflow of a doctor's life. But this is the moment that our family is being broken apart. Now, some people tell me, Regina, you just had a bad doctor. If you hadn't had a bad doctor, no one would need to hear your story. And I say, no, I only have 15 minutes to talk to you. Okay? I can only tell you a few of the segments of what happened, but there were others. There was the MRI machine, closed MRI at this facility. They wanted to put him in it. I said, he's horribly claustrophobic. They're like, that's fine. We'll just double dose him with Ativan. And they thought that would work. Not so much. So he goes into the chamber, and he's freaking out. And the tech comes out to me and says, Mrs. Holiday, you're going to have to go in there and calm him down. I'm like, okay, okay. We run into the room. And she says, give me your watch. Give me your ring. And I do it because she must be robbing me. I don't know why she wants these things. <laughs> so, so I start to calm my husband down. She never asked me for my name tag. The minute the machine comes on, whoop, right into the chamber. I didn't know it was magnetic. I just knew it was an MRI. See, the question is, how are you asking things and how do people understand them? The other thing that happened was transport. So my husband was told he could get palliative radiation. We said, what's that? They said, it will help with the pain. Yes, we want anything that helps with the pain. So we said yes to that. And then a tech crew from outside the hospital wearing rain gear comes in our room. We're like, what's going on? They said, well, we have to take you to radiation. Well, that's downstairs, right? No, radiation's across town. It's in a facility way out there. We're going to take you by ambulance. Now, it was the first day at work for one of the techs. She hadn't done a lot of lifts with people who were bedridden. So instead of taking the pull sheet and lifting him over, she decided to shove. What she didn't realize is where she shoved his hip was a point of metastases. And that's where my husband's hip broke while hospitalized. I got very frustrated. So I found out there's a place called medical records, and medical records are supposed to give you your entire medical record. And I went down there, and I said, I want my husband's entire medical record. And they say, that'll be 73 cents per page and a 21-day wait. I said, you've got to be kidding me. It's, it's right in that computer. All you've got to do is push print. And they said, that's just the way it is. Well, at the same time all this was going on, my husband was a huge Stephen King fan, right? So the fall of 2009 was when Under the Dome was going to come out. This was a really big deal if you're a Stephen King fan, because this was the book Stephen King left in a taxi cab years before. It was his only copy. He lost it forever. He wiped his hands of the book, said he was never going to rewrite it, and then he did. So it was like the grail of Stephen King fans. And my husband was hospitalized and was worried, because he's like, Reggie, it's the fall of 2009. I don't know. Am I going to make it to read the book? So I emailed the book buyer at the toy store where I worked. She emailed a publisher's rep. He emailed the marketing director, and the marketing director emailed Stephen King. and said, can we get a book for this man with cancer? And Stephen King said, yes. And so in one week, we had a book by an A-list author seven months before publication when we couldn't access the medical record in the facility we were currently admitted to. On April 18, 2009, it was a Saturday. And what I did every single Saturday is I would wrap little presents right beside my husband, and they would be hidden in the room for the children, because the children visit on Sunday. It was like an Easter egg hunt every single week. And it was so it wouldn't be so bad. Because this is scary, and Daddy doesn't look so good anymore. And there's sounds, and there's beats, and my eldest child has autism. And I'd wrap the little presents, and we'd hide them. But this Saturday morning, the doctor, he came to the threshold of the door. And he stood about as far away as you are right now. He didn't even come in the room. And we had a list of questions. There were questions that Fred would remember in case the doctor came in the room. They were, when are we going to get chemotherapy? When are we going to get a palliative pain consult? When are we going to get surgery? When are we going to get a walker so my husband can try to walk again? And the doctor said, don't worry about the questions. We've decided we're sending you home on a PCA pump. And my 
husband and I began to cry because we knew what that meant. That's a euphemism for being sent home for hospice without even using those words. So he said, how are you going to do that? How are you sending us home? We have a one-bedroom apartment. It's not handicap accessible. We have two little children. One's ten with autism. One's a three-year-old. How is he coming home? The doctor said, well, that will be a question for the discharge nurse on Monday. And he left us on a Saturday in a hospital. And that's when my husband said, go after them, Regina. Because up to this point, he didn't want to make waves. Up to this point, he was everyone's friend. But they were just going to send us home to die without even treating us. I fought for five days to get a transfer to another facility for a second opinion. We managed to get transfer, but they sent us with an out-of-date and incomplete medical record and transfer summary. That meant the new hospital could provide no care while they tried to cobble together an electronic medical record using a phone and a fax machine. The nurse in charge of the floor came up to me and said it was the worst transfer she'd seen in 20 years. They couldn't even feed him because he had no dietary orders. But she said, we won't notice if you go downstairs to the pizzeria and you get him a slice of pizza. At 1230, they finally got him back on his meds. And by the one o'clock in the morning, I was back home to my children. The next day, I came to the hospital. Fred's doctors came to me and said, Mrs. Holliday, we want to send you back to the first facility to get his entire medical record. We want it all. Film, CDs, a full printout of the record. And I laughed in their faces. <laughs> I said, I've been trying for four weeks to get that medical record. They will not give it to me. And they said, they're going to give it to you this time. You're getting it for us. We're sending you as a courier. The old hospital printed out the medical record in an hour and a half for the new doctors. And they got it, and they read it, and after an hour, they gave it to me. And I said, wait a second, you said this was important. You said you had to have this. And they said, yes, it is important, and we have nowhere to put it in our system. So if you have it, you're going to be the person who maintains his continuity of care. You're going to be the person who goes with him from facility to facility to facility. And I read that medical record, and I was furious. Not just because it had medical errors in it but because it had actionable data that was not acted upon. The most glaring began in his imaging results. On 325, when he was first admitted, it states, patient's bladder is distended. On 327, patient's bladder is distended is affecting imaging results. Nurses' progress notes for 47 stated, concern, patient's retaining urine. Radiology report of 410 states, patient has dangerously distended bladder to the point of rupture. And that day I found out about it. Because the radiologist off-site, the day my husband's hip was hurt, she actually grabbed me and shook me a bit and said, Mrs. Holiday, I've been trying to call your hospital. I've been trying to call your doctor. They're not returning my calls. You need to make sure that your husband gets a catheter placed when he gets back to that hospital because I can't even get good images with how distended he is. So get him done because it's really dangerous and he could rupture at this point. So I get back to the hospital, I run to the nurse's station, I tell the nurses, listen, my husband, he has a distended bladder, radiologist told me he's in catheter place immediately, you're going to need to call a urologist, because my husband has a pre-existing condition, it's called a urinary tract stricture, he's had catheter placed twice in his life, both times he needed a urologist. And the nurse said, well, we'll try anyway. And so they tried with the 16 gauge and were unsuccessful. They tried with the 12 gauge and were unsuccessful. And then finally they gave up and called a urologist. He came 24 hours later. The progress notes for that day state, patient refused treatment. So what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this when I'm just a sales clerk and I'm just an artist and I'm just a nobody? Well, I spanned a thousand of my friends and said, I need a wall. I need a big white wall in Washington, D.C. I'm going to paint my husband's medical records on a wall. Because that's the one kind of transparency we're going to need in healthcare for people not to get be so injured. And a delicatessen called Pumpernickels called me back and said, yes, they give me their wall. But it was right next to the menu. I said, okay. <laughs> I'm going to paint end stage cancer next to bagel and lox. Are you going to be cool with that? <laughs> and they said, yes. Because they'd seen things like this happen in their families. So I painted a mural that's based on the nutrition facts label with a really easy graphic for you to understand everything that's wrong with this patient. And I put it on a wall for the entire world to see. And it immediately began starting ripples of change. At the same time, I was using Facebook as a kind of caring bridge. 
I friended everybody. I friended my friends. I friended my husband's friends. I'm like, follow. I will state our progress every single day on Facebook. And the beautiful thing i got to tell you about that is an open community is open and willing and helpful, but also they're still with me today. And then the scariest thing in the world happened. See, I worked three days at the toy store when my husband was sick, and I called them sanity shifts because I just had to get out of the hospital for a day. I'm sure you can understand that. And when I was at the toy store, one of my old customers came up to me, and I said, I feel I must tell you my husband has kidney cancer. And she says, oh, I just met this man. His name is E-Patient Dave. He, he survived stage four kidney cancer. I'm like, he survived stage four kidney cancer? Nobody survives that. I must meet E-Patient Dave. How do I meet E-Patient Dave? She says, you get on Twitter. And I said, what's the Twitter? And she says, just go home tonight and figure it out. And that night, with the help of my 10-year-old autistic son, I learned how to tweet. <laughs> and this is my first tweet. I am trying to talk with Christine Kraft and E-Patient Dave. Now, if anybody does Twitter, they know I did that wrong. Okay? <laughs> but E-Patient Dave is absolutely so amazing, he found me with that tweet. And he started to tweet at me and realized I was Twitter incompetent. And then... He started to email me, and then he started to call me, and he introduced to me to this thing called ACOR, Association of Cancer Online Resources, where all these people were beating cancer. And then he even said, you need to talk to my doctor. And then at 10 o'clock at night, Dave's doctor was talking to me on the phone. Now, Dave's doctor works at Harvard, okay? He's a foremost authority on kidney cancer. And I'm talking to him, and what's amazing is he's listening. He listens to everything. He doesn't interrupt me at all. And I tell him everything that's happened. And then he does the most brave thing. See, I talked to other doctors that were friends of friends. And they always told me, we've got to see the patient. We've got to actually make him a patient before we give you any kind of opinion. But Dave's doctor just paused. He said, you know, sometimes we catch these things too late. Sometimes the best thing you can do is decide how you want to spend the end of a life. So we went to hospice. And the hospice was beautiful and kind. And my husband had something called a hospice turnaround. That's where your pain is maintained correctly. And you can then talk again. And you can eat again. And you can be with your friends and your family. And we had three weeks of beauty. And then the discharge nurse came. And she said, so your husband's stable. We've got to see about sending him home. And I said, how are we going to go home? We have a one-bedroom apartment with two kids. One has autism. One's only three. So it's not even handicap accessible. So how are we coming home? She said, have you thought about moving? So we moved. We got our final New Year's resolution. We got our two-bedroom apartment. And my husband was home for six days. On the second day, the hospice nurse came up to me and said, this is really hard. Your husband is very compromised. We might need to send him back. I'm like, oh, you told me we had to move. You told me that we had to get a new place to live so he could come home. She's like, that's how insurance works. You have to go home and prove it's not working. I'm like, no. We swore to him that this was his last transport. We will make this work. We did. And on the sixth day, my husband woke up and yelled, Reggie, my catheter blew. And I called the hospice nurse, and she came out to place a new catheter. And he looked up her and said, you're so good at that. And she said, well, I better be. I was a VA nurse for 20 years. And then she started to sweep our floor. And I said, you don't have to sweep our floor. And she said, you just go be with your husband. And here's some atropine drops for when the secretions get bad. And there's this term, it's called terminal restlessness. And I thought that was like a Tom Hanks movie or something. But it's a real thing. And for some families, it's really tragic and horrible because their loved one changes the last day of their life. But I had my Fred back. Because I married a man who pulls all-nighters and is frantic and excited. And for one night, he was back. And we talked till dawn about Stephen King and our children and our wife. And at 6.30, he turned to me and said, Reggie, you look so tired, you should go to sleep. And I said, I am, I will. And I slept one hour. 
Then I got up for 730 meds because Fred was very compliant. And then I crushed his, I basically first tried to give him the pill and he wouldn't wake up to give him the pill. So I crushed the pill and I put it on his lips and I put it on his tongue and I gave him his water bottle and I said, here, all you got to do, Fred, is suck. And that's what he did. But he wouldn't open his eyes again. And his breathing, it got so slow. So I ran to my mother-in-law and my children. We got to his bed and we said, Daddy, we love you. We love you so much and it is okay to go. And he stopped. And my friends took the children to the playground. And the hospice nurse came and she said, Would you like to help clean the body? She said, Just hold him up. And I held my husband for the first time in months. And then they took him away. And when my little son came back from the playground, he saw all of his daddy's stuffed animals still there, but his daddy was gone. He said, oh, no, they left his stuffed animals. And I said, it's okay. We'll put them in the casket. And we did. And at the graveyard service, my little son Isaac, he stood there looking down to his little cousin Ellie. He said, oh, my daddy has a treasure box. We had a memorial service. And on Monday, I taught art at Vacation Bible School. But on Tuesday, I began to paint. I began to paint and blog and tweet and Facebook and do everything I could to make sure families like ours didn't have to suffer as we had. So the painting I did was called 73 Cents. This painting is 17 feet by 70 feet. It's on a major corridor of Washington, D.C. Within that painting, my husband and our family is in the very center, and all the players on the stage within healthcare are displayed, and not one of the 17 people in that painting is making eye contact with another. And that is the kind of health care we had in 2009, and in many patches of the world, it is still the kind of health care we have today, and that is our duty and our job to change. On October 20th, we dedicated this mural by singing songs from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Okay? It was an amazing night. And one of the last songs in that musical is, Where Do We Go From Here? And that is my question for all of you today. See, that nurse, she's on the burning platform of the old way of doing business. Okay? And see that boat, that H-caps boat in the water? There's a patient in there, and they want to help her. We want to be part of the team and change healthcare together. I began painting about data sets trying to make people aware this stuff's available and you can read about it. So this is George Washington University Medical Center. Was, I was never treated in this facility. All the information I've gotten about this facility I got online. So I painted their HCAP scores from 2010s. And when I looked at them in 2010, they were getting C's, D's, and F's on their report card for patient satisfaction. And I decided to paint this painting not only, but I painted it in front of the hospital. Right by major metro tunnel. There was a huge crowd. It was amazing. A board of the director's person came up to me and said, where did you get this information? I said, it's freely and publicly available online. People are going to start making choices about their care based on this kind of information. I also painted a painting that was part of Body Shock the Future. They asked very easy ways we could rapidly change healthcare and make it better. And I decided to point out that this little preschool child has a lunch pail on top of a toilet. And I talked to preschool art for many years, and every child I ever worked with knows you do not eat off the toilet. That's bad, right? But here we have a nurse beside the bed, has like a feeding tray in her hand, and that's the bedside tray table, but it has an incontinent bedding change materials on it. And I called nurse friends from all the nation. I said, I've seen it at five facilities, but is this pretty much nationwide that the bed tray is being used for incontinent bedding changes in food service within hours of each other? Yes. And that is something that has to change because with things like C. diff, we cannot clean these old-fashioned kind of tables to the level they need to be cleaned to stop hospital-acquired conditions. I also had the beautiful privilege of getting to be part of meaningful use. So I testified before the subcommittee of Congress that patients need rapid access to the medical record. And on July 13th of 2010, I got to be on stage with Kathleen Sebelius, who is Secretary of Health, Don Berwick in charge of CMS, David Blumenthal, who was in charge of the ONC, Regina Benjamin, who was our Surgeon General, and I, Regina Holliday, wife of Fred, was on that stage talking about the power of data, how it can change things. 
This is Dr. David Shear. He believes that patients who have electronic devices put inside their body should be able to get to that information. Currently, that information goes to the vendor who made the device, the doctor caring for the patient. The patient is not part of that data loop. There's other patients like Hugo Campos who are also working very strongly to make sure getting to data is a reality. This is Bell & Health in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's an amazing hospital. Um, I got to visit it, and the CEO, who was once in housekeeping, okay, he asked his stroke team, because they're well known for their stroke care, um, how are our patients doing like two years out? And the stroke team just looked at each other, we don't track two years out. He said, get on the call, find out, how are we doing two years out? <laughs> and so they called up Betty. So, so they called her and said, hi, Betty, this is Bell and & Health. And she said, what? Oh, this is Bell & Health. Oh, you sucked. <laughs> you almost killed me. You lost my medical record three times in four days. And they, you know, okay, some facilities, if they get a Betty, they're going to walk away really quietly, right? But what Bell & Health did is they invited Betty to an event like this one. And she sat there in the center. And she has complete filter failure, so she tells the total truth. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to watch Betty talk. And everybody loved Betty. And they were getting a new electronic medical record system at their facility. So what they did is they called it Betty. It was never referred to anything else other than Betty. And all of a sudden, it created complete culture change. Because before that, everybody was so angry that we are changing EMR systems. Why do we have to do this? We're used to the old system. We're doing it for Betty. We're doing it so Betty can get the information. And it was world changing. The other thing they did was in a room with round tables, they had all these EMR workflow groups, which are pretty complicated groups, but every single table had a happy face balloon on it. And I asked them, what is the happy face balloons? They're like, those are patients. Every EMR workflow has a patient on it. Blue button. This is a really big deal. This is something that came out of the VA, and the concept is, what if there was a button you could push and you could get a data dump, you get a data download. And this is another path for patients to get to their data, and now it's being used by TRICARE, Medicare, and other institutions are starting to do it. Learning health systems. There's a whole bunch of groups that are getting together now that are asking people to join them where they share data freely. There's no charge to be one of the data sharers between the group. And that's really changing the world for a lot of institutions and a lot of academics. There's also the PCORI project. With PCORI, basically, that is a whole bunch of scientific studies that are being done, but one of the caveats within it is you must have patients part of your scientific discovery team. And they say, take it very literally. They have to have real patient presence, and it's amazing. Open Notes. So, Open Notes was a study that came out in 2012, but I learned about it in 2010. So I was on Twitter tweeting about the power of opening up doctor's notes and nurse's notes, and they said, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation started tweeting to me. I'm like, wow, I've got like a thousand followers. I'm really surprised. <laughs> you know, and they said, listen, we're working on a study about doctor's notes. I said, how about nurse's notes? They said, well, right now we're working on a study about doctor's notes. <laughs> they said, but pay attention. In 2012 it came out, and it was amazing. Because it said things like 90% of patients responded they understood, were not offended. Only 1% to 2% were offended. 87% of the patients basically... Um, did look at the notes. This was a big deal because we had been told that patients are lazy and they're never going to bother. Um, doctors in the study said it only added a minimal workflow uh, part of their time. And then finally, 80% of patients grain, claimed greater adherence to their medical protocol because they read the notes. Okay? That's a big deal. And of the 1% to 2% that were offended, one doctor explained one of those cases. It turned out a patient had read for the first time in his medical record that he was morbidly obese. Yeah. And he called the doctor's office. He started yelling at the doctor. He says, I just read on my medical record that I'm morbidly obese. I want that out of my record. And the doctor said, we have a way of doing that. And 60 pounds later, it's not in there. <laughs> okay. This is something, too, that's amazing. It's being worked on the consumer reporting system for patient safety. So this has been in process right now. They're trying it out regionally. The idea is what if there was a website or a 1-800 number that a patient or caregiver could call in the hospital that it's not affiliated with the hospital to report when the abuse becomes too bad? How could that change things if people knew there was a safe way to report? This is Michael Graves. Michael Graves is a designer. He made this amazing teapot for Target. And then he had a disorder that destroyed his lower spine. And he went into rehab as a paraplegic. 
and he was so angry at how badly designed rehab was, he decided to change health care, and he's doing it. He's now designing hospitals. He's redesigned the institutional use wheelchair, and it's amazing, his design. I mean, I've only interacted with wheelchairs a few times, and they're badly designed. When you're trying to lift a patient who can barely walk, you've got that metal part sticking up. It's a nightmare, right? He's fixing those kind of problems. It's spectacular what happens when other people from other fields work in healthcare. This is my son Isaac at a clinic appointment. So see all those toys back there? There's what once taught you how to be a patient, right? Well, now technology is what's teaching children how to be patients. He went to a clinic appointment in Washington, D.C., and they gave him a netbook, and they said, you can start building your medical record. And he did. He was five, okay? So he could type, right, type Isaac. <laughs> and so then I worked with him. We filled out all the fields. We pushed submit. We tried to give it back to the secretary. She said, no, no, no. You push submit. I already have it. You can now surf the net on the netbook. So he's surfing the net, and the doctor brings him into his appointment, and then they Google his medical condition together, and they talk about it. And my son owns this, right? He was told where the prescription was going to go. It was going to be electronically sent to our CVS. And, and he literally struts out of that room like this. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And so, so one month later, we have a regular six-year-old annual checkup, okay? And so we go there. The doctor puts my son, tells him to get up on the table. He's sitting there in his paper gown, starting to wiggle. Then she turns her back to him, starts typing into computer, and asks me all the questions. Well, he lasts about two minutes, right? And then he jumps off walks right up to her and looks up at her and says, when's it my turn to type? That's the future, right? That's the kind of patients that we have coming. They want to be part of the care. Okay, the walking gallery, telling the patient's story one jacket at a time. At this point, we have 344 members of the walking gallery wearing 377 jackets. We are all over the world. We are represented on five continents, and people are telling their patient stories right on their back. We're heavily supported on social media, Facebook and Twitter, and that's how we communicate because we're kind of flash mob. We just show up at events. Um, this is my son Freddie's jacket. Now, this was him in the painting. So in the painting, the big painting, he only exists within it as an eye in a door crack, okay? Because that's how welcome he felt in healthcare. In the painting that he wanted me to paint, he said, Mommy, I want you to paint the visitor parking kiosk at the hospital and I want you to put a skull on top of it. I want you to put coins in the eyes and the mouth and pouring down. Because you shouldn't make a family pay to park when they're watching their daddy die. And that was his experience, and that's what he talks about when he goes to a gathering of the walking gallery. This is my little son Isaac. That's a jacket he painted himself, and this painting includes that clinic experience that was so good. That's his jacket called Feeling. And he marches with me, and he's part of the movement. And that's really important, because how he remembers his daddy is in a hospital bed. And then there's me. And there's my jacket, which is Little Miss A-type personality. <laughs> right? This painting, this technique that I did, is called painting a negative space. See, I didn't paint an A on my back. I painted the world around it. You can take a negative experience within your life, and you can flip it and turn it into a positive. This is an article that was on the patient's net, and it says, Regina Holiday is not special. I love this article, because I'm not. I'm just a regular person who decided to dedicate all my talents and abilities to making healthcare better. And I'm sure that's what you plan to do as well, and are doing actively within your lives. I will be at a comic book convention in May. Isn't that amazing? I will be there. Kaiser Permanente is paying for the booth. I pitched the idea of being at a comic book convention in D.C. They said, well, what, what does a comic book convention have to do with health care? I'm like, well, have you seen the people who go to comic book conventions? We need some work, right? <laughs> um, but also, you've got to meet people where they live, love, and play, right? You've got to meet them where they are and bring them into this conversation. You're the future. You're the present, right? You're the ones who are changing this world to make it better. And what I would like to do to finish this up today is just close with a poem I wrote called The Writing on the Wall. When I was only six years old, I wrote upon the wall. So sad and small and all alone, I wrote my cares on stone. The other children laughed and played like ants. They'd come and go. 
but I stood silent, chalk in hand, and I wrote upon a wall. The teachers, they would pass me by, and they'd talk amongst themselves. The children ran and laughed and played and left me to myself. And I would draw and sculpt and scratch. The art would soothe my soul. And I left the best part of me as powder on a wall. At seven years, I learned that walls are hollow things, that fathers beat and children greet, whips with tears and screams, that gentle hearts can't help but bow before the rage, that walls give through to fists and boots and drywall cracks with age. I wrote my sorrow on a page and I dropped it in the wall, hoping it would speak for me if I could speak no more. Seven years old I may be, and slow and sad and small, but even I can read the writing on the wall. At seven years and thirty, I'd find the wall again. I'd remember in my sorrow bricks could be your friends, that cinder blocks and stones could calm, that paint could make amends. So I smeared all my grief out, and I painted it on a wall. And the children, they watched in wonder, and the world would hear my call, sometimes within our grief, sometimes in tears and rage. You could write your testament in gigabytes and paint. When I was only six years old, I wrote upon the wall, so sad, so small, and all alone, I smote my cares on stone. But I no longer paint alone. This world has heard my song, and I thank God each night my friends log on. They read the writing on my wall. Thank you. Let's see. Thank you so much.